Nothing on the show is to be construed as legal advice. The contents of this show are for informational purposes only. Hello, welcome to another uh, episode of Know Your Rights, the consumer uh, podcast or lawcast, if you like. Uh, we also have the YouTube channel. This week, we've got um, Todd Friedman from the law offices of Todd Tre- Friedman um, along with us. Um, he's a great friend of mine, and he's also uh, you know, one of the most uh, well-renowned uh, consumer advocates in Southern California. Um, welcome, Todd. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, apparently Ali is the uh, redheaded stepchild because I didn't mention him in the introduction. So uh, Ali is obviously uh, an attorney at uh, Casarini Law Group, and uh, he's uh, um, in charge of the intake process. And obviously, he's the one that has the most interactions with our, you know, with our, with our clients. And uh, I think for the purposes of today's conversation, his insight is going to be really, really, really useful. Thanks for being here, Ali. Good to be here. Thank you, Abbas. Um, so first of all, how are you guys coping? Uh, now we're six, seven weeks in, uh, who's losing their minds? Well, I have kids, so me more than you. <laughs> well, actually, I think your kids are trying to get away from you because for, for those of you that don't follow Todd on social media, he's the TikTok champion and like <laughs> his TikTok videos are amazing, but it always, I always feel like the kids are like, dad, you're really freaking embarrassing me. <laughs> there's one even with you in a cat outfit dancing fairly like I would say about 50 meters away from your kids and they're kind of like shaking their heads that's almost so, like for me uh, hitting on the dolls you know my daughter's <laughs> yeah. it's all about the yeah. final product it is uh, good, good production quality too um, so with that said um, we, you know, we had a show maybe, I don't know, three, four weeks ago, maybe even a little bit longer. And when Corona was coming out and the quarantine was about to happen and we were anticipating certain types of litigation. But now that we're six, seven weeks in, the leads are coming in and we're going to get some uh, Ali's insight into that. And the litigation has already begun. Anything from the, you know, the, um, the privacy sector, you've got the Zoom litigation going on because obviously everyone is Zooming with the social distancing all the way to business interruptions and, um, you know, employment arena, um, all the way to refunds and so on and so forth. And we're going to kind of go through that um, bit by bit. Um, Ali, let me go to you first. Um, sure. At Law Group, what is like the main issue that, you know, the populace is having, like, you know, our would-be clients, um, what is their main, you know, fear, complaints, or the things that they think they need legal representation for? I would say by and large, the majority of calls we're getting are in regard to refunds. Um, you know, things like Ticketmaster, it's, I, I think it's threefold when it comes to refunds. It's usually events, things like concerts and various shows like that. Airlines is a really big one. Um, and then tuition issues as well, people trying to get tuition back from universities. And it's, it's very interesting to see sort of um, from a PR perspective what these companies are are saying publicly, um, you know, you have someone like Ticketmaster where while all this craziness is going on, they're sort of quietly changing the language in their own policies to exclude um, refunds for shows that are rescheduled. So normally their policy would say something along the lines of, you know, if your, if your event is rescheduled or canceled, we'll issue a complete refund. Somewhere along the line, they went in there and changed that to say, if it's canceled, we'll issue a refund. So all these well, ho- well, hold on a minute. Are, they, are you saying that they're changing the po- terms and conditions or the policies and procedures like retroactively? Well, so th- that's the issue, right? Are they able to do it retroactively? It seems like that's what they've been trying to do, at least from the calls that are coming in. People are saying, look, I purchased this ticket for this concert in July, let's say last year. Um, from what I remember, it said that if something was rescheduled or canceled, I would get a refund. Now it, they're saying it's going to be rescheduled but they're not giving me a refund. So this is obviously a, a huge issue that, that we need to deal with. Well, let, let's hold the retroactive thought, like this, like footnote that just for the second, but I want to come back to that. And if I, if I forget, like remind me and like start waving your arms, running around the room, we'll do something to like bring me back to that. But Todd, are you seeing a similar pattern? Because I know that you're very heavily involved in the intake at your law firm. Is that kind of similar thing that you're seeing? In terms, in terms of, general intake yes so yeah so first off i mean you know we're consumer attorneys and 
fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to couch it, you know, when the economy is bad, um, people are losing their jobs, we get more calls regardless. So the stuff that we've been typically seeing over the past few years before this pandemic, debt collection calls, uh, issues with people's credit, you know, people losing their jobs, we're seeing more of that now, unfortunately, due to the pandemic. So our intake on the, the, the normal stuff that we we see is is almost doubling. Um, getting back to Ali's, some of his points, yeah, we're seeing uh, a bunch of the university stuff in terms of tuition. Some, some of it's a little bit more nuanced. It's not just, we're not giving you refunds, but, you know, live classes are now turning to online classes and people who um, actually pay for online classes are now you know, paying the same price as people were paying for live classes. So we're seeing a lot of those. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, universities are even changing their terms and conditions. To, and we'll get back to that point later on. Um, yeah. But actually as well, we saw a couple of those intakes today that we were discussing. Um, yeah. Stub up cases, you know, people bought tickets or sold tickets, can't use them. Um, but a lot of these refund cases, the price gouging in, uh, intakes have been um, astronomical. You know, people complaining about, um, you know, certain, you know, big chains increasing their prices and these people can't even, you know, afford to, to pay those prices. Um, some of the complaints are not really well founded. You just kind of have to sift through them, but we're getting a lot of price gouging uh, Got it. complaints right now. Well, I mean, you, you heard it here first. I mean, our um, uh, YouTube um, and podcast from about four or five weeks ago, we kind of highlighted the California uh, price gouging statute, which is actually a criminal statute. And we thought that this may be an issue. And sure enough, it, it, it was. Um, so that was, um, you know, I, I hope it wouldn't be, but it, unfortunately it is. But let's go back to Ali's point, the footnote that I said. So first of all, we always say this. It's been, you know, there's a warning at the beginning of the show, everybody. We're not giving legal advice. Every case is different. If you want actual advice, feel free to call or find yourself an attorney. But let's just take that hypothetical um, that Ali gave. So somebody calls Ticketmaster or StubHub or whatever, buys a ticket, and then retroactively they change the terms and conditions. Is that going to be um, enforceable? From my perspective, I think it's simple contracts law, really. I, I would say no, because there's a meeting of the minds when you first purchase the ticket. And those are the terms that bind the two parties together. You can't, after the fact, go and unilaterally change the terms and say, now these are the ones you're going to be bound by. What do you guys think? I mean, Todd? I totally agree with you on that. I don't think they can change the terms and conditions. My biggest worry would be the arbitration clause that would, they probably previously agreed to when they went and they, you know, went into it. So it would really depend on where you filed a case like that, what type of judge that you got to be able to beat art to begin with. I think if you overcame that hurdle, I wouldn't be half as worried about them changing their terms and conditions, especially in this, you know, pandemic era. I think that's bad. Leave, leave a bad taste in a judge's mouth, frankly. But and, and I, I find it kind of offensive too, um, Ali. I mean, like the company is taking these people's hard earned money. We've got almost a 20% unemployment rate. People need that money to put a roof over their heads, feed themselves. And Absolutely. they're like, we don't know when this concert's going to be in the future, but because it technically hasn't been canceled, you're not getting the money back, and we're going to keep hold of the money. I mean, I, I find that personally just on a very facial attack, very offensive. Absolutely. Look, I mean, uh, pe people have busy lives, you know, and uh, some people travel to see their favorite band. Some people buy tickets, you know, for an anniversary gift with their wife when they take off from work. Like, you can't just change things like that. On And, and I think if, so on that note, you know, as you said, meeting of the minds earlier, uh, I've been seeing the same thing with universities. So, for instance, I was saying how it's interesting seeing how different institutions are sort of reacting to their to their whatever their policies are. And I know at least some universities, for instance, where they're changing, let's say they're not canceling a semester, but they're saying, OK, everything's online. Uh, they've come out, at least some of them, and said, look, you're going to get the same professors and the same quality of education. So what's the problem? The problem is exactly what you said, the meeting of the minds, right? When these students or potential students signed up and paid to go to this university, they didn't pay for the online course. If they did, that's one thing, but if they paid to be in a classroom setting, in a traditional classroom setting, that's what they should get. And if they can't be offered that, they should not have to pay, in my opinion. 
Well, I'm, I'm not even saying that they shouldn't pay, but there should be a price differential at least, right? Right. Something needs to be done to get closer to what it is, you know, to, to, to compensate for the fact that we can't now offer what you signed up for. I think Todd had something to say. Yeah, especially the university, like we talked about, has a separate online program that's cheaper. The people, you know, who can't be in the classroom, which is understandable, safety is the most important factor, but if they can't be in the classroom, they shouldn't be, they should be paying the same amount of money as the people who are paying online. It's just common sense. I mean, also, I think it's just a different experience you're paying for as well. I mean, it's been a while since I was at law school. Ali, you were probably the, the most recent graduate. I mean, even that's, that's still been a fair few years. But sure. when I was at law school, you know, they have the lunches, the, the, the guest speakers that would come in, you know, they would, you know, put on the, you know, there would be the different organizations that you get involved in. And it's that interpersonal kind of atmosphere that I think is value added because when you even have a, you know, office hours with your professor and you're in person and having that personal relationship with them and being able to have some kind of camaraderie with your classmates and have study groups. And yes, you can technically have a Zoom study group, but it's just not the same. You can't be sharing notes the way that you were before. And that interpersonal relationship that you would have, I think, is value added. I agree. And also, I mean, something like, you know, in law school, they always talk about the Socratic method. I mean, how many of of you two personally, how many of your classes were completely taken over by the teacher asking one student a question, someone else chiming in, and now there's a, a whole debate. Try doing that on a Zoom meeting with, with 50 people. You know, it's, it's not going to be the easiest thing to, to, to achieve. It, it's actually a really good job you mentioned that. I was just on a faculty meeting at Cal Western um, because I, I teach there, and I'm going to be teaching next semester on Zoom. And um, good so luck. I've got an upper, upper elective class, and my class is very much interactive and it's all about me you know calling on different students talking about consumer law and talking about and a lot of the cases that we discuss are our cases Todd's cases our cases and I know the lawyers and I'm trying to explain this to them and get their reactions about what was really happening and how that's going to play out on zoom I, I honestly don't know and I just cannot imagine it's going to be as good but I, I will certainly I think we should have a round two or even Todd and you should be a guest in one of my or a couple of my lectures. You you can actually feel it for yourselves and see how it goes. Was well, a former law student who hated the Socratic method because I always got embarrassed <laughs> when I was called on. I think this is going to be great because now the student can be like, "Oh, technical difficulty. I, I can't hear what what." So I'm all for that. <laughs> Todd might pay extra for the online course. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, that's funny. Um, Here's a, here's a real question, Todd. How, how many of your classes were you actually sober in? <laughs> <laughs> I was writing screenplays, actually, during most of my classes. So I was actually very sober. I well, just wasn't you know, paying attention. And for those that don't know, Todd has a legit Hollywood movie that has been produced, made, and he's in it. He wrote it. He produced it. And when is it coming out? Hopefully, at the end of May, it'll be fully, fully done. It's about the collection industry, um, you know, so which we obviously know a ton about. And yep. it's really based on my experiences, you know, suing debt collectors over the past, you know, decade called collection. So we're excited about it. Um, and I've read the, the I, read the, I read the full script and um, even maybe bold enough to say I had a couple notes on it here or there. Um, <laughs> It, it is really good. It's funny. It's actually true to life. Um, and I'm actually looking forward to seeing you in the courtroom scene. That's going to be kind of sure. cool. Really, really cool. I've lost so a congratulations. Of time, That's so. amazing. Yeah, thank you. Do we, do we have a name for it yet? It's called Collection. Collection. Yeah. So very yeah. close. Very close. I, I, I actually think it's going to do very well. It's not the type of thing that goes straight to DVD and makes it really big in, in Slovakia. This actually, I think, may do well. So no, we're like, hoping it streams. Funny story, Todd actually asked me to star in the film, but uh, I was pre-booked already on <laughs> their engagements. So maybe the next one. I think one. that was another film. But we'll talk about <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, this is somewhat of a family show. Stop right there. Um, all right, so we were talking about um, the uh, kind of in the same vein as the um, – educational institutions, but like, you know, getting refunds. I think there've been a, probably about 10 to 20 lawsuits against gyms because people on automatic renewals, 
They're paying their monthly fees, but they're not getting what they bargained for, which is the access to the gym. And the gyms are not refunding whatever. And I've actually read that 24 Hour Fitness is literally about to file bankruptcy. Um, so that, that, well, it's at least been suggested. So it's, um, it, it's going to have some devastating effects. I mean, uh, do you want to talk to that a little bit about these kind of institutions like gyms where they're not giving refunds? So I purpose, and I do a lot of the intake for my firm. Um, and I personally haven't seen um, a, a ton of those cases come in, surprisingly, because we, we've, we've had a bunch of auto renewal gym cases in the past. Yeah. Um, so I'm surprising I'm not seeing more of those. Um, but I think it'll be a lot of question of maybe contractual interpretation. You know, is there a force majeure clause in the contract or whatnot? Um, I, I don't know, but I feel like if, if there is an auto, an auto, an auto renewal statute in the state, in the state of California, um, and especially if you cancel, you should, they should stop taking, if they keep taking money out of your account, the violation of that statute, maybe F done a, a bunch of other things. I just but I mean, but, but, but let's even say that consumers, most consumers probably will, I mean, in this time, they may forget to cancel the auto renewal, but let's even say that they don't cancel. Let, let's play what you just um, stated. Let, let's follow that through a little bit. Isn't there an unjust enrichment kind of argument? Is like they're getting the money, but the consumer's not getting what they bargained for. So like they're getting unjustly enriched. I mean, that would be the argument, right? Yeah, on one hand, yes, there's an unjust enrichment argument, but if the consumer isn't, you know, complaining about it, you know, and they're not doing anything to stop it, you know, then what what's the point? I mean, unless like a year later he's like, oh, the gym reopens and they they retroactively go back and say, well, I want to get, you know, last year's, you know, fees refunded. I, I don't know. But, yes, there's definitely an argument to make there. But, I mean, isn't the point of class actions because you get, you know, I mean, because I'm guessing not the entirety of the populace of the gym is not complaining. I'm sure there are a couple of individuals that are complaining, saying, hey, that's $25, that's $35. And some gyms are $150, depending which gym you go to. They go and say, listen, I'm not getting the benefit of the bargain. Give me my $150 or $30 back. And they say, no. Would you not say that they have standing now to represent everybody and saying, hey, we all want our money back for that month? I 100% agree with that. And if you can, again, I hate to be Debbie Downer here. If you can beat the arbitration clause, and that's a probably, probably a good class action. That, I think, yeah. I mean, that, I think that, that's a separate issue. I, and I agree. A lot of these gyms are going to have an arbitration agreement. Um, and that's going to be a problem. Um, but let's go to your force majeure argument. Now, for those of you that are listening and watching and not legally, um, you know, and most of us, most of our viewers are not going to be lawyers. Force majeure means act of God. So if there's a tornado, if there's a hurricane flood, those are like what are called for, force majeure defenses where there is a, there's a contract and one of the parties breaches because they could not perform because of an act of God. Now, I think we would all probably agree that um, people can't go to the gym because of the social distancing that's being put in place because of the um, uh, of the of COVID nineteen, and in the same way, um, they cannot produce the goods or the, their service of offering the gym for the very very same reasons. So, that Todd playing the devil's advocate and like showing the argument that Jim would use is like, well, yeah, there's an act of God, but, but I, would, I would argue the same thing for the, for the consumers. So it's kind of a wash, and therefore we should be put, put in the position that we would have been but for the contract, which is give me my $30 back because you're not providing anything, and then let's continue the contract when it's practicable. Totally agree. I think that's a really good argument to make, um, unless you're in Georgia where the gyms are open. But, you know, <laughs> a really good argument to make. Um, but there's also, you know, you know, you've been hearing rumblings on Law, Law 360 that, you know, Senator Mitch McConnell wants to pass a, you know, a bill that says you can't file a lawsuit or class action because of the coronavirus. I don't know how much how much weight that's going to hold or what, what's going to happen with that. But, you know, there's definitely business interests in mind. And, lobbyists and laws that could get passed that could um, prevent, you know, people like us from filing, you know, lawsuits to protect the consumers. Right. And I think you're talking about business interests. 
Let's talk about business interests in a minute because I think where those two concepts don't reconcile fully um, is in our next topic. Before we go there, just to you know, go full circle for our audience, it's that if you are partaking in some kind of service or good deliveries that is being interrupted and, you, and you're on some kind of automatic renewal, you're making monthly payments, you very well may have a claim because you're not getting the service or the goods that were promised to you for the money that you've been paying. And I think if that's what's happened to you, you should definitely call someone like Todd, myself, Ali, or other attorneys near you because those are valid claims in, from, from, from my perspective as, an, uh, as a consumer advocate. But let's go back to Todd's point, and, I, and, and, and that's a great transition, which is McConnell's point of view is, well, we need to protect businesses because that's the backbone of our industry. But ironically, it is corp it, 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 it's, it's corporate America that is also having a hand in destroying the businesses in which is the backbone of our economy in the form of business interruptions insurance denials. So, and I know you have, you've been very much involved in it with me on this, Todd. So why, why don't you um, expand a little bit and Ali, I'll have you uh, chime in a little bit. Yeah, I mean, small businesses, especially, you know, they purchase this insurance, um, you know, business interruption insurance, which provides for a payment, you know, um, if the business is interrupted due to something like a pandemic, it's I'm sort of like where, you know, small businesses applying for that PPP, you know, PPP loan or something like that. Um, and now you have these insurance companies um, because they're getting so many claims that are just, you know, starting to routinely deny, um, you know, payments to the, to the insurers. And it's becoming a big problem. You're seeing a lot of complaints about it. Um, a lot of lawsuits are going to start coming out about it, and it's 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 terrible. It's just a terrible thing. Yeah, and and I think there is also a, another set of business lawsuits regarding the PPPs, which is you know the um the the, the government offered up a, you know some money to assist businesses and to be operational and not lay people off. But there's theories, at least, that on lawsuits that have been filed that certain types of business were being discriminated. The bigger businesses were getting the loans over the smaller businesses, which really it was designed for. Um, Ali, why don't you talk about some of the intakes and some of the things, things that you've been experiencing on those two kind of theories? So, you know, three words when it comes to the business interruption claims, policy, policy, policy. These are every single one of these claims um, requires really looking word for word through your policy. And most people either don't have time to it, they don't have time for it, they don't even know how to access it. You know, I think the point is there are, are attorneys out there like myself who don't have kids, who only have a cat, and who have time during this coronavirus season to sit down and go through your entire policy word for word. Let someone take a look at it and see whether or not if you are denied coverage, there's anything that can be done, um, you know, for that. So. I think it's interesting. A lot of cases you have, to, it's, you know, if it was just cut and dry, hey, look, you don't have business interruption coverage. So, you know, obviously the claim is denied. That's one thing. But we're talking about people, as Todd said, who are every month paying their premiums for business interruption coverage, and they're still being denied. Now, sometimes those denials, you know, are, are it makes sense. maybe there's a virus exclusion in there. But a lot of times they don't. And it's just left up to a particular ambiguity in the contract or in the policy. And when you're looking at something amb ambiguous in the contract, you have on one side this small business owner who's paying his premiums. On the other side, you have the insurance company that actually drafted the language of the contract. So fortunately, in our courts across the states, if there is ambiguity there, an attorney will find that. A consumer attorney can find it and use it to argue that you should be covered. So it's just it's really, really difficult to, to get a copy of your policy first thing first. Make sure you have the entire policy and get it over to someone um, to really go through it and see whether or not you should be entitled to coverage. Yeah, and then and then the insurance company is also thinking, let's deny these claims. If this, you know, Joe Schmo decides he's going to get an attorney and sue us, go ahead and sue us. You know, we'll drag it out. The courts are obviously slowed down right now because of COVID. Some courts are even closed, um, and it, it's it's really they they try to use like the situation to their advantage, and which is you know. Call like it's terrible. So I mean, yeah. Um, so um, let, let's hope that uh, McConnell doesn't get his wish. <laughs> like that, that's the takeaway there. Um, so 
So, Todd, I mean, I know you guys do um, more employment than we do, and you do a lot of, like, um, you've been doing employment class action for a while now. What Are you seeing any uh, derivative um, employment kind of cases um, as related to uh, COVID-19? So, we've, you know, we're getting a volume of calls, you know, of, you know, people wanting us to look over their severance agreements or we lost our job because of COVID. Um, we're having a hard time getting unemployment because, you know, 30 million plus Americans apply for unemployment and there's a backlog on, on that. A lot of that stuff we can't really help with, you know, California is an at will, you know, state. Um, so if you're losing your job and it's due to COVID, there's technically nothing illegal about that. Some of the things that we are seeing, though, um, are, you know, people not wanting to come into the office because they're not essential, wanting to work from home, um, or they have pre-existing health conditions that can make them more susceptible to COVID, and they're reaching out to HR and saying, I'm going to work from home for a few days, and then they'll get retaliated against, um, you know, demoted, let go, something like that, because of, uh, you know, them trying to protect themselves and their health. And we, we see that... At, we see those as good cases. I mean, those are in our either whistleblowing or retaliation cases um, that we can help people with. But we're definitely seeing just a lot of employment intake generally. But that's definitely a derivative case, um, you know, due to COVID that we're seeing. Got it. Um, okay. And I think uh, lastly, we're kind of what we mentioned at the beginning, um, the price gouging. Um, Ali, why don't you talk to me a little bit about price gouging, what kind of things you're seeing on the intake? You know, price gouging. I think it was uh, in the in the first few weeks when this crisis began. We definitely were receiving um, many more calls than we are now. I think now at least the majority of the sort of reputable big businesses out there are no longer you know charging sixty dollars for a you know hundred middle middle milliliter bottle of hand sanitizer on their shelf. Right. Uh, but it, it's still out there. Um, it's still out there and like Todd mentioned earlier with the insurance company sort of taking advantage of, you know, the worst possible situation. I mean, it's exactly the same case here. It's, you know, it's pretty cut and dry. Um, they're not allowed to do it. If something seems much more expensive than it should be during this time, pick up a phone, call someone, is, see whether they're allowed to be charging what they are. I would say definitely the calls have gone down based on this, but it's, I think it's one of the more egregious sort of viol consumer violations here. Yeah, it's, I, I feel like the righteous case is pretty offensive. Um, what is your experience, Todd? I mean, I got like seven calls today, you know, and on price gouging and and a few that I haven't gone back yet. I had a dentist uh, reach out, you know, stating that, you know, the, his normal PPE that he gets uh, from his medical supply company, they've like doubled the price of that. Um, so he's really, you know, fired up about that. And that's the case that you and I are actually going to be looking into. Um, yep. You know, a couple people, I got one person saying, you know, an unlicensed person is selling stuff on the street for double than what he normally does. Right. Oh, like, <laughs> you know, like, we get calls like that all the time, right? Um, and <laughs> some interesting ones, you know, this, this, this thing's being sold, this product's being sold on Facebook. This guy's selling something on Facebook or eBay for triple the price normally that it should be. And I don't, and it, can we hold them accountable? I, my gut says I don't think so. I don't know. But. I mean, probably, but I mean, the reality of the situation is you're, you're probably chasing ghosts because this guy is probably working, or, or it's just nobody doesn't have any money and work uh, like, you know, middle of nowhere. But I mean, it is illegal conduct from, from my perspective, at least. Right. Well, and a couple well, of them, I, you know, there's one at a big, a big uh, you know, chain where. The, the, it looked like it was a good price gouging case, but she, you know she couldn't afford to to pay the difference, um, so she didn't really have standing. You know, so yeah. I, and I think, and I think that's a that's a really good point because we, I'm, I've noticed we've got a lot of calls where people are noticing that you know certain product um, or a certain good is way more expensive than pre COVID, and that would be a really good lawsuit but for the fact that they didn't purchase it. And so you don't have standing because you haven't been injured by that harm. And so in order to be able to bring a lawsuit, I think it's important for our listeners and our um, viewers to understand that 
you actually have, at least in California, you need to have been harmed by that price gouging, which essentially means you have to have purchased it at the increased price. And in an ideal world, though this is probably not as necessary, um, keep the receipt. Let's, you know, let we, because the burden of proof is on you if you are the one bringing the claim. Right. Have you noticed any of these, uh, you know, no standing, you know, uh, intakes, Ali? Absolutely. I, we, I've had several calls in the last couple of weeks of people saying, hey, look, I saw this at whatever store. And I say, OK, just send me, you know, let me see your proof of purchase. We could go from there like, oh, well, no, I'm, I'm not going to buy it at that price. And it's, <laughs> so it's good to know, and it's, you know, so, but like you said, if you haven't been actually harmed by it, uh, there's really nothing that we can do to protect your rights there. Yeah. Give my final thoughts. Did you guys go anything else you want to add uh, to what we're doing on the COVID front, guys? I have no? one, you know, w one quick thing from me is just it's really interesting to see, especially what some of the big players in the game, some of the really big companies um, are trying to get away with. One thing that I didn't really get into is airlines. Hot mess with airlines. Tons of airlines calls every week. Um, you know, in some of these cases, it's not just about looking into the policy. Some of these cases don't even require that. So with airlines, for instance, we had a, I had a, someone call me last week complaining about a major airline where her ticket was canceled, the airline canceled it, and yet they're refusing to give her a refund. So for things they, like they that- They gave a credit, right? Right, and for things like that- That's a great case. The Department That's a great of Transportation case. has their own rules hold, on hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. Did you sign up the client? <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but so Carry on. For, for things like that, the Department of Transportation, you know, the, a, a separate agency has already made a rule on that. If, if an airline can't your flight, you are entitled to a full refund. You know, it makes no difference if it's tough for them. If it's tough for them, guess what? It's also tough for the person who's out $1,000 on that plane ticket is also dealing with the crisis. So it's, it's just very, very interesting to see what companies are talking What about, about conversely, though, if you're now afraid to fly because well, of the see, pandemic, what happens there? Right. So then it's different. Then it comes down to, okay, we need to take a look at the airline's policy, right, to see what you're entitled to. But the point is, in some cases, it's so egregious where, hey, look, it doesn't matter what your policy says. This is the law, you know. Um, so, but like you said, m the majority of cases involves looking at the policy, seeing now if I canceled it, um, am I entitled to only credit or a refund? And I think that is the case for most of the major airlines. If you cancel because you're afraid of flying, but your flight hasn't been canceled, um, for the most part, you're probably just entitled to that credit. But then other airlines also have policies where if we just change the timing of your flight, you know, now where there's, uh, let's say one airline had five flights in one day from LA to New York, and now they're trying to put all those people on one morning flight because they just there just isn't a large enough demand. Too many people canceled. Most likely, depending on that airline, you're again entitled to a refund if the, the time of your flight has changed substantially yeah. or if there's no I, when there wasn't. I actually had a scenario kind of between both of your hypos, which is the client um, had a ticket um, going with, with a major airline. But then he um, was scared um, to, to basically go and meet, see his parents and because of Corona was just breaking out. So he canceled and under the policies, he was only entitled to a, a credit, not a full refund. No harm, no foul, no, no issue at that point. But then subsequently, before the date of what would have been the departure date, the airline canceled. They give everybody else a refund, but they don't give him the refund. They just give him the credit because he canceled before they canceled. Right, right. I know someone who's in exactly the same boat, um, and they all they did was um, was refund the change fees that are normally charged when they wanted to to cancel it. They were initially charged a, a cancellation fee, and they went back and retroactively refunded that. Uh, as far, but th th they were not refunded the whole amount like everyone else. And and it's it's kind of unfortunate because all he was doing, all he or she doing, was sort of preemptively you know, doing what they probably should have been doing and being cautious and, and they got penalized for it. Todd, when I gave you my hypo, you were pulling faces. You don't like that one. No, I just thought it was actually an interesting, right. I, I was like, oh, you canceled, they, you canceled first and they canceled after. 
That w- I don't know. I mean, that w- that would be an interesting fact pattern. I, like I would that. sue for that, and I know you sue for a lot less. Well, yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that out. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before, uh, before, uh, before we go, Todd, yes, no question. Are you wearing pants? No. <laughs> there you go. I'm not either. <laughs> to be fair. Um, all right, ladies and gents, thank you very much for tuning in. And so, like, you know, we gave you an insight into like four, you know, predominant areas that have been derivatives of COVID 19. You know, we're talking about insurance, price gouging, we're talking about not getting full refunds, and of obviously the employment aspect of it. But I don't want you guys to think that this is an exclusive list. Um, There's going to be a myriad of different ways that COVID-19 that are probably going to be screwed out of something here or there by corporate America. And if you're not sure, there's a simple answer. Most consumer attorneys worth their salt are going to give you a free consultation and tell you if you have a case or not. So please, please, please take advantage of that wherever you're located in the United States. And in the interim, please, please, please socially distance yourselves, stay safe, hope your family stay safe, and until next time, keep it legal.